us, you know. I got thumped by my section commander on one of my first night patrols that actually stopped right underneath the street light. I was so concentrating on getting into cover that it didn't occur to me that I just lit myself up by the street lights. The walls, the bricks, you had to check that there was no bricks slightly sticking out. Because what they used to do is put a little bit of amount of explosives on it with a pressure pad. And if you leant against the wall... In some cases, they'd even paint walls white so that at night you'd be silhouetted against the, the white background to make yourself an easy target. In Northern Ireland, you don't look after number one. You look after number two, number three, and number four. And they're doing the same. Because if you're looking after them, they're looking after you. That's the way it works. On the 6th of February 1971, 20-year-old gunner Robert Curtis was hit by machine gun fire, the first British soldier to be killed on duty in Northern Ireland. With the province in chaos, in August 1971, internment was introduced. Suspects, mainly Catholic, were now being locked up without trial. About 350 people were arrested immediately and detained in old Nissen huts on a disused RAF airfield that became the Longkesh Detention Center and later grew into the infamous Mays Prison. The long-term effect of, of introducing internment was to act as a recruiting campaign for the IRA and brought a lot of young people who may not have otherwise been involved into the Republican movement. If you'd like to think of it as a simmering pot, it boiled over in the space of those few hours when internment came in. The riots that kicked off after internment were some of the most violent and vicious the lads had ever seen. We were on the streets uh, constantly. We must have had um, a riot a night. And out we went to be confirmed. The most horrendous riots uh, that, that I have ever seen. Vicious things. The women would be in your face every time, right up close, um, swearing and shouting at you, spitting at you. Um, they had a system of uh, alarm calls with dustbin lids and whistles, you know, referees' whistles, that sort of thing. And as soon as you enter the estate, you'd just get non stop out of abuse. Just this constant roaring of the mob and just shots being fired all the time and the constant firing of tear gas by our side. The rioters would throw anything they could find at you. If it was big enough to, to pick it up and throw it at you, they would do uh, bricks, bottles, stones, lumps of wood. Um, I believe an axe was thrown at one patrol. I mean, all the army training obviously prepared you as best they could but um, actually going around the area where people are throwing ball bearings off the flats to try and actually kill you. Surreal, I think, is the word. I was hit by a flying bottle. Now, when it happened, all my training went totally out of the window, and my first reaction was, I'm going to kill that little bastard. And I chased him down the street through a, cr through a crowd of people. And I gave up because he was clearly going to um, escape from me, and I couldn't shoot him, really. Um, because it wasn't quite the done thing. It wasn't the done thing because we were being asked to fight with one hand tied behind our backs. The rules of engagement in Northern Ireland were governed by the yellow card, which were our rules for opening fire um, in the province. It told us how we should challenge people and how we could open fire. I do remember you had to give I'm sure it was three warnings. You would say, halt British Army, hands up. Halt British Army, hands up. You would then cock your weapon, halt British Army, hands up, I am ready to fire. And if this person had a gun, you still, you still had to shout, halt or I'll fire. I mean, you could imagine, you're in a riot. There's some bugger gonna chuck a petrol bomb at you. I'm gonna shoot. Put that down, I'm going to shoot. By then he's thrown it and gone. Absolute nonsense. Well, I never done that. I used to fire and shout, halt, hollow fire. I thought, what's the difference? 
Because if I shout it to him, halt or I fire, he's going to have me before I have him. Would we have been more successful if we didn't have those types of rules of engagement? Absolutely, yes. Load up, load up, load up. We run. Unable to retaliate, the lads got some terrible injuries during the riots. A friend of mine had his arm broken um, by being hit with an iron bar. Uh, another lad had his jaw broken. Another soldier lost teeth from being hit in the face with a brick. I got hit in the side of the head with a brick, um, and which knocked me out. The NCO behind me at the time uh, was hit in the face with a broken bottle, which um, put him on the floor. So we were both dragged out of it. Um, simply by being hit with bricks and bottles. Army officials back in London seemed oblivious to the chaos going on in the province. My colleague and I have been up all night and the phone rang and it was a colonel from the Army Medical Directorate in Whitehall and he wanted a situation report about what was happening. So I opened the window and put my phone out because outside about 50 yards away was one hell of a firefight going. You could hear cracks of bullets, machine guns, and a Molotov going off somewhere. And I held the phone to the window for about 30 seconds, pulled it back in, and I said, that's, that's the situation report, sir. And he said, well done, jolly good show, and carry on. We had a couple of riots um, where it really did get frightening. Um, in one occasion, we were trapped uh, inside a block of flats um, and we were expecting them to start using petrol bombs and all sorts. Uh, at that point the section commander actually turned around and said right, you know, you see anybody with a petrol bomb, he said don't wait for me to tell you, just shoot him. And on the word go, that was it, we drew our batons and basically charged straight out into the street and the fact that we came out running um, took the crowd by surprise. They ran for it so we were able to get back together, get reorganised and then uh, back on the street again. We were getting used to fighting the war on the streets, but before long, we had to fight it on TV as well. The rioters knew that if they started to stir things up um, at around about five o'clock in the evening, after they'd finished work, then we would react and we'd come out. But at the same time, the press and television cameras would come out. They would catch us reacting uh, in a heavy-handed way to what the rioters had built up. And it was very good PR. I was sent out with a snatch squad, that's about eight of us. And the barricade was up, there was about five or six on the barricades, and they mentioned a couple of figures coming up causing a lot of trouble. One of them was one in yellow. When we rushed out to go in to, to get him, he turned out to be a she, and she was big. She was, she was about 16, 18 stone, a woman. And uh, she spat in my face and called me a English bastard. I said to her, I don't mind you calling me a bastard. Do, don't ever call me English. And I started rattling her across the legs. Of course, the sergeant came rushing up to me and saying, the cameras are there, the cameras. And when I turned around, it was. It was BBC, ITV and all them. All, this was all like staged, like for a film sequence, waiting for things to happen. By the end of 1971, 48 British soldiers were dead. But the total for Northern Ireland, including civilians and terrorists, was nearly 200. But this was just the beginning. When the troops arrived, fire was opened up. 1972 was the bloodiest year of the conflict. By the end of the year, there will be nearly 2,000 bombings and 10,500 shootings, with 223 civilians and 129 British soldiers dead. It was the worst year for the British Army since the Korean War. On the 30th of January 1972, 27 civil rights protesters were shot by members of the 1st Battalion of the Parachute Regiment during a march in Londonderry. Do not fire back for the moment unless you identify positive targets. No, no. The organisers of this civil rights march promised that there would be non-violent. 
The army have said throughout the day that they hope to use minimum force. But three hours after the procession began, this has ended up, as dusk comes onto the bog side, as the worst ever confrontation between the army and the Catholic people of the Cragen and bog side. Thirteen people, including seven teenagers, died. The day became known as Bloody Sunday. It was the catalyst for a massive bombing campaign by the IRA. Despite all our training, nothing could prepare you for the horror of a bomb blast. I remember walking up a street and seeing a sheet of glass blown across the road. And it was traveling at a fantastic rate of knots. And it was horizontal to the guy that it hit. And it took his legs off at just above the knee. I can remember crouching down uh, down by a gateway and getting my bearings look about me. I could just see, um, I didn't recognize for a start what it was, but it, it was somebody who'd been caught in an explosion. I'd seen things which were similar to that before um, in Borneo and other places, but I'd certainly never expected to see it happening on what I regarded as British soil. It's really difficult to even see whether it was male or female or um, what. You know, I... I had to start thinking of the guy who'd gone down, not as a human being, but as a piece of meat. I didn't think of him as a human being. You couldn't afford to think like that for very long. When I was here in the 1970s, there were parts of Belfast and Londonderry that were quite literally battlegrounds, where so many bombs were planted and so much terrible destruction took place. One of the worst was the Falls Road in Belfast. Driving down the Falls Road is a really eerie experience. It hasn't changed much, it still feels the same. There's still menace in the air. And it just makes your memory roll back to the days when there were riots here and you never knew what was going to happen. Um, and the jungle drum, if you like, round this neck of the woods, if they ever spotted uh, uh, you know, an army patrol, then yeah, you were in trouble. We were driving along, it was the Falls Road. It was a particular part of the Falls Road which was extremely spooky um, and very uncomfortable to be in. Then all of a sudden, there was this massive flash. It didn't seem like a bang, it was just a big whoosh and a big yellow flash. And I suddenly realised that we had been lifted clean off the ground and several, several tonnes of armoured vehicle with us in it was now flying through the air. And it was a very, very, very strange sensation, as was the, the bump as we landed. And what had actually happened in that short space of time is one of the groups had fired um, a prig, and, and, and what a prig is, it's, it's a homemade, handheld, like a bazooka, if you like, that, that fires um, uh, an explosive. And the first time that happened, if the IRA at the time had been organised better, we would have been very, very vulnerable because we did not know what was going on. On the 21st of July, 1972, within a space of just an hour and a half, the IRA detonated 22 bombs in the centre of Belfast. There was carnage, with nine people killed and 130 injured. Soon to be bomb after bomb after bomb. There was a pause, another bomb, pause, another bomb. The atmosphere was absolute panic because nobody knew where the next bomb was going to go off. Um, you could be right next to one you didn't know. It was sheer terrorism. Uh, nothing short of sheer terrorism. I just remember this young lady running around the back street with a pram. She was crying her eyes out. So there was this baby in the pram, crying as well, screaming, and she's running down the line. I've often thought of that baby many times since, and that, think of the world that baby was born into. <sighs> Just a, a horrendous day that is, is in your memory forever. 
This day became known as Bloody Friday. 